All right, people are rolling in. We're going to wait till we get a critical mass here and we hit the top of the hour, and then we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. So thank you all for coming. We're getting there. <laughs> There we go. Up to 12. I hope everybody is doing well this evening. It's a fine Thursday night. Give it about 30 seconds. People can roll in uh, as they can there after the top of the hour. Mia is sending me some critical information. Yes, I'm aware of, I'm aware of the registration thing. It seems like people have been able to jump in here. All right, it's seven o'clock. And as we all know, Richard Dillman is the most timely and prompt person on the planet. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and people can drift in on West Marin time as they see fit. Um, thank you for all jo for you for joining us this evening for Richard Dillman's talk on the history of radio in West Marin. I'm Amanda Eichstead. I am the station manager and executive director here at KWMR. Um, feel free to put questions into the Q&A or the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will um, have some time to answer questions. So Richard will be able to do that. And the presentation leaves time for questions at the end. Um, this event is our second and final Zoom event during our fall pledge drive. We had one on the very first day of the drive with Dewey Livingston that lives on the KWMR website. And we are recording this event as well. So we'll do our best to get that up um, within the next few days. We are in our pledge drive and we have a goal of raising $50,000 by Saturday night, which is in just a couple of days. Uh, we have those few remaining days. We are at about 73% of our goal, thanks to all the folks who have contributed. And any contributions that are made tonight will be put towards um, the overall goal at, at, as one block. It won't be individually. But if you have not made a contribution and you would like to, especially after your socks are blown off by this presentation, you may do so by going to kwmr.org. And in fact, Richard Dillman has his own uh, fundraising page during our crowdfunding. So I'm going to put that link up in the chat box if anybody wants to make a contribution to Richard's page during um, or after the presentation. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Richard Dillman and he will take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Well, coming to you from the uh, radio cave up here on uh, Eminus Ridge. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be part of the uh, webinar this evening. I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen. Just to begin, we have a slideshow here. Um, and it's uh, largely composed, in fact, entirely composed of photographs that give us a hint of some of the history of radio in West Marin, which is rich and goes back a long way and actually does have a connection to our very favorite community radio station here in West Marin. So we're going to be talking about radio. That's, um, that's the topic. And we've got to understand one thing about this radio business. 
And that is what we're talking about here is magic. It's magic. Uh, nobody knows how these radio waves work. Now, I know if I look at the manual and I, I look at the book, and I know if I build it in a certain way and I have the right number of turns on the coil and the right all the rest of it, I know it's going to work. How it works, no. And if you're at a party sometime and you see some guy standing over in the corner, you know, have the horn rim glasses and maybe a bunch of screwdrivers and a couple of alignment tools in the pocket here, that's going to be your radio engineer. So if you go over to the radio engineer and you say, listen, uh, you're a radio engineer. Yeah, that's right. How does radio work? Well, he's going to start telling you about uh, voltage standing wave ratios and resonance circuits and all. And I say, no, no, how does it work? And he's going to have to admit that he doesn't know. And that's OK, because nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's magic. It's almost like our little planet, which is so formed that it has just the right amount of water and just the right amount of land and just the right gases in the atmosphere and just the right temperatures to allow life to flourish. It's almost as if much in the same way the planet was constructed and built to allow radio to take place. It's astounding how that works, but nobody knows how it really works. So here, uh, towards the end of the 1800s, middle to the end of the 1800s, people started to get a hint that something was up, that energy could be sent uh, through the air, no wires, and be received at a distant point. And there were a lot of people who were working on this. Here's one of the most famous, uh, Hertz. And he has got his spark gap going on over here. There's little, little wing antennas going on. And here he's standing not too far away with a loop of wire. And when the spark jumps across the spark gap on one side of the room, another spark jumps across the spark gap that he's holding. How can this be? There's nothing between him and that spark gap, yet somehow energy is being transmitted from one to the other, obviously. Well, other people observed similar things. Other people tried different approaches, but it was really resigned to something that was a laboratory curiosity. It was something that they knew happened under certain conditions, but nobody really thought of it as much more than that. Well, then it comes a very nice Italian boy Guglielmo Marconi, here he is as a young man. And he was just fascinated by this stuff. And I certainly get that. I got the radio bug practically from birth. Um, he just said, well, this is, you know, he, he got wind of this uh, in, in some of the experimental literature that he was reading. And he just started uh, building and trying to see what he could, maybe what he could make work. And here he is out in his garden. Now he was fortunate uh, the, the family was fairly well to do. Here he is in his uh, father's estate near Bologna in Italy, and he's, he's got uh, an evolution of his uh, wireless. And here he is with the uh, this steel plate or maybe copper plate antenna. And that uh, here's another guy down down the end here. That's, he presses the key at his end and he's receiving at the other end. Now Marconi was not an engineer, was not a scientist. And, and that's good because all the engineers, all the scientists were telling them, look, what's the matter for you? Everybody knows, everybody knows radio waves don't go through dirt. They don't go over the horizon. You cannot receive these wireless messages anywhere beyond line of sight. So why are you even messing with this stuff? Well, he, that, that didn't dissuade him. He just kept going. And here's some of his more advanced equipment that he was now getting uh, 20 miles, 10 miles, 20 miles, 50 miles, getting 100 miles um, distance. And according to everything that everybody knew, every scientist, every engineer, everything that they were telling him, by that time, he's out at 100 miles. The radio waves, if they were right, the radio waves should have been way, way, way above his head, way beyond the height of any antenna that he was using. So he knew that something just wasn't right here. What, what the given wisdom was, he was showing that that just was not the case. Now, everybody was saying, OK, very nice. That's very good. But look, this is a toy. Would you just would you please do something practical? And his um, his father thought the same thing. His, his father, Giuseppe, 
uh, so it said it was like you get a commission in the Navy, you become or, or go into business. This is this is this is kid stuff. It's never going to lead lead you anywhere, and it would not support his son's ambitions. And Marconi never forgot that. He never forgot his father's failure uh, to support him when he needed it as a as a young man. Uh, to the point that he he didn't even go to his father's funeral. Now that's keeping a grudge. You know, much respect. Knew how to keep a grudge. But luckily for him, and rare for the day, his mom had an independent fortune. And as you can see from this photograph, nobody to trifle with. And where did the fortune come from? She's Irish. She's not Italian. She is the heir to the Jameson whiskey fortune. So she's got independent funds and she did believe in her son. So she said, Guglielmo, I believe in you. Go down to ham radio outlet, get everything that you need. Here's my credit card. Well, of course there was no ham radio outlet. There was no radio. He's building this from scratch. So he's building all of his apparatus from scratch. He's a very good uh, experimental, builder of experimental apparatus. And he's putting this stuff together and he's continue, continuing to refine and refine and test and test, not really knowing what he's doing, but okay, let's try this. Let's see if this works better. Well, okay, how about this? Little different antenna, little different coil. Let's see how this works. And that's the way he made his progress. Now we're gonna jump way ahead here. He was getting, as we said, a hundred miles. He was, you know, he had, he had reached, he had leapt across the English Channel, which was a, a enormous psychological feat. Uh, by this time, um, he's getting a thousand miles. And he says, well, if a thousand miles, why not 3000 miles? Why not across the Atlantic? Why not connect the continents by wireless? Undercutting the undersea cables who had a complete monopoly on the intercontinental communications at that point. That was, and of course, having a monopoly, they were charging everybody through the nose for the privilege of sending a telegram, let's say from the UK to North America. So he formed a company, board of directors, all the rest of it, stock certificates, he held by far the predominant position in the company. And they were trying to make some money out of this. Of course, that's what the board of directors want to see, where the sales, where the profits. He wanted to continue with his experiments. And of course, the great dream was to leap across the Atlantic and make that connection between the continents. And here, he commissioned uh, the construction of the most powerful transmitter in the world, which wasn't saying much because there weren't a lot of other transmitters in the world, but this was a monster. This thing was enormous. And here you see the antenna. This is on in Poldu on the Cornwall coast in the UK. And this is the transmitting. The idea was he's going to have this enormous transmitter, got a similar receiving setup on Cape Cod uh, off of Massachusetts. And he's going to go there. This transmitter is going to send a single letter S he's going to go there and if he can hear it, he's proven that transatlantic wireless communication is possible. Well, any engineer or anybody looking at this antenna constraint, remember now this is on right on the coast, right on the Atlantic coast, looking at this antenna and notice that there's triadics going across the top and at the different levels connecting every one of these spindly masts holding this thing up. Well, what do you think is going to happen? after the first store. Well, you're absolutely right. The thing is on the ground. It's completely destroyed. And same thing at the receiving point on, in North America on, on, on Cape Cod. Now, all the biographers, everything I've read about Marconi and this, uh, many, many just great, great reads, but, but they all agree that he, he would never, this never lost heart. I mean, here he is, he, he has bet his reputation. He has bet his company. He has bet his fortune on this, that he's going to be able to leap the Atlantic with these wireless signals. And here's these matchsticks on the ground. Never lost heart. Co uh, commissioned the Poldu transmitter to be rebuilt with a much better, more sturdy antenna. They were able to accomplish that. But in North America, it was just, they, they did not have the reserves didn't have the reserves to reconstruct a similar antenna there for receiving. So he's kind of stuck. I mean, what's he gonna do now? Well, he decided that Newfoundland 
uh, would be close. I mean, it's North America, so it counts. And it's a lot closer to um, Poldu than Cape Cod. So he said, okay, we're going to Newfoundland. And here he is with his assistants. And uh, George Kemp, his faithful assistant on our right here. I mean, check out that mustache. That is a man's mustache. Now, Marconi, the best he could manage with this scraggly little mustache, but Kemp, look at that thing. So here they are. They're in St. John's, Newfoundland in December. Now, I don't know how many folks have been in Newfoundland in December. I have. I can tell you, that is one cold place. And they were given the, um, the use of this um, tower, sort of a building, a tower on the top of what's now called Signal Hill. Maybe it was still called it then. at St. John's, Newfoundland. So, okay, that's, that's what they're going to do. That's how they're going to, that's where they're going to use. That's their, that's their receiving setup that they're going to try. Now, notice here, they're sitting on a wicker basket. And that's significant because in that whisker, wicker basket, there's, there's a balloon, maybe a couple of balloons. And behind them is a kite. So that's the plan. They're, they're just going to loft a wire with the balloon, with a, with a hydrogen-filled balloon. And if that fails, that they're going to use the kite. So, okay, here, of course, it's blowing a gale. It's the middle of December. It's on the top of a hill in St. John's, Newfoundland. So they send up the wire with the balloon. And, of course, the, the wire breaks. The balloon heads off down when hadn't been seen to this day. The balloon is gone. Whether they tried uh, the balloon a second time, it's a little unclear in the, in the literature. So they go for the kite. And a, a lot of writers say, well, among the many things that Marconi was known for was his kite handling. Now, OK, he's a great, who knows? He's a great kite handler. And that's where that really came in handy, because here they are. They're trying to get this kite up in the air. And you can see the way they're crouching and trying to get this thing. The, you know, the wind is blowing. But they do. They get it up. They do get the kite up. And it's stable. It's bobbing and weaving up, you know, up, in, up in the sky. But it's, it didn't break. It's not going away. The, the, the wire, the receiving wire is up there. So they go back inside. And they're now listening, listening for that letter S that they know is being pounded out by this mega station across the ocean in, New, in uh, Cornwall in the UK. So here he is uh, sitting at the table with the uh, apparatus that he's going to use to try and and listen to this. Now, what they used was not anything like we're used to today to listen to radio signals. They used this. What is this? This is called a coherer. And it's an evacuated glass tube, right? And it's got these two plugs here, brass, brass plugs, wires sticking out, and these filings in between. So when a radio wave, an electrical signal, is imposed on this thing, those filings cohere and the thing conducts. Now, by our point of view today, this thing is about as sensitive to radio waves as a 10 penny nail. I mean, this thing, but they did tremendous work with these. Now, the thing about it is that after those filings cohere, when the radio signal goes away, they stay cohered. So they had a tapper arrangement to decohere the thing. It was amazing what they did. But the end point was not that you listened to it by ear. It marked a taping, a tape. There was a paper tape that ran through this machine and made a mark every time it heard. So you had a visual record that you actually heard this thing. Well, here they, they've got the coherer. They've got the tape. Everything is set up. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing's happening at all. So Marconi said, OK, we're going to give up on this coherer thing. We're going to use an actual earphone. And here's the earphone that he modified. And you can see it's got this, uh, this horseshoe magnet with the coils and all the rest. And the objective was to make this as sensitive as you possibly could to, to any, any radio waves. And he wired that into the circuit. And he's listening, and he's listening. And he hands the earphone to George Kemp. And he says, Mr. Kemp, do you hear anything? Now, now, Kemp is on the horns of a dilemma here. He's freezing his ass. He's thinking about the pub down in town with the roaring fire, hot meal, warm bed. What's he going to say? Yes, 
Yes, I hear that letter S. Absolutely. Let's go. So, well, you can start a fight in a radio men's bar to this very day by claiming that Marconi did or did not receive that letter S on that day in December in Newfoundland. And no matter what side you take, pro or con, the other side is going to ask you to step outside because they, they'll take the opposite position. But you know, it really doesn't matter because within just a few years, less than a decade, already he has established this intercontinental, net, intercontinental net, continental network of wireless stations that is achieving his dream, connecting the continents by wireless. And here you see uh, in the United States map, San Francisco, All right, That's us. Really, it's Marin, but the city that it's associated with is San Francisco. So now it's bringing it on home, bringing it on home. Now the, the cable operators, so they, you know, here's the, their, 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 their monopoly is down the tubes, their stock crashes. They say, we've got a monopoly, we're gonna sue you. They say, ah, sue me, yeah, sue me. Uh, that didn't go anywhere. And he's undercutting them by 50% and still making tons of money, even with all the infrastructure it took to accomplish that. Well, here we are coming right on home. This is a view of Bolinas, looking out at this ranch on Mesa Road in Bolinas. And Dewey will remember the rancher's name. And here, not too long after, same view, it's the radio, the radio transmitting station. Here's the original Marconi building, it's still a standing, called Building One now. And here's the hotel and the cottages used for the, uh, the staff and management. So it took them not very long to build this thing. But of course, all the material, which is this enormously heavy stuff, had to be brought around the horn and sailing ships. Some folks have said that some came across um, on the Transcontinental Railroad, and that very well be, be true. Uh, the story I heard is that had to be reinforced to accept this. And schooners from San Francisco, including the very famous schooner Owl, uh, brought all this stuff. Well, here, this is a view. This is Mesa Road in Bolinas. And you, know, you, you see, some things never change. Here's what, four, five, six guys standing around, one or two guys working, everybody else watching. But you notice they're not even using wheels here. They're using a sledge. And we have a contemporary um, account of somebody trying to visit the station after it had been constructed by going out in the rainy season, I guess, uh, here along Mesa Road. And he says, literally, the horses just about disappeared in the mud. It was so horrible to try and get across this road, but they did it, they did it. And here's the building they built. Here's building one, still standing. Uh, and, and you see here, these things kind of floating in air. That is the antenna wires coming down from this massive antenna that they had that stretched all the way. This is around the cliff uh, on that property and stretched all the way from there over to Mesa Road. So uh, a, a lot of stuff here, a lot of artifacts. For me, when I walk around, uh, these areas, it's almost, it's almost like Easter Island. You see these things looming and you know, what is this? How does it work into the greater scheme? What do they mean by this? But here's building one anyway. And that's, that's where the great Marconi transoceanic trans-Pacific spark transmitter was installed. And here's what it looked like. These are some new pictures that we got within the last couple of years. And here, you know, I guess I would have rather not have the writing on it, but now with the writing, we know unambiguously what we're looking at. And here's the drive motor, 500 horsepower drive motor, an alternator here that's generating the voltage for the spark gap, which is behind this wall in an allegedly soundproof room. Even with that, um, the stories that we hear are that you could hear this, this, this gap crashing away, it made so much noise. And upstairs is uh, just a little bit of a hint of what it took to manage the energy that spark gap produced and get it tuned and get it out into the antenna where it needed to be. So a lot of the framework that you see here and the traveling crane and all the rest of that is still there in, in building one. Uh, hallowed ground to me, the most historic spot on the site. Now here is a photograph. Again, these were recently acquired photographs. Here's building one taken from the top of one of the Marconi towers. And here you see 
this this circle uh, around the building that is what we would call today a halo ground that's where all the ground wires come together and attach now the ground system is as uh, important and as mythical and as famous as the antenna system maybe even more so and you can see here these plowed lines and what are they doing they're going right over the cliff into the ocean a large buried zinc plate out here in the ocean and then out toward mesa road under all the antennas just the work that they did to make all this happen and here's here you see looking in the other direction you can see these plowed lines again each one of them part of the uh, the ground system where the wires were laid in just amazing amazing stuff that they did to make this all work well the transmitting station is good but it's not going to work unless you have a receiving station as well it's got to be two-way so here's the same thing again although this time with horses this time with wheels and this is heading on up to marshall where the marconi receiving station was built and we all know this because the buildings are all still there and here we see here this is now a meeting house, but this was the powerhouse. In Bolinas, they did not generate the power on site, and that was a big saving. Some of the other stations that we saw in that diagram, they were remote enough. They had to actually build a power station on top of everything else. In Bolinas, they didn't. They brought in uh, separate lines from two substations, uh, Woodacre and Alto, and we still see those names on our switchboards at the, uh, at the power station in Bolinas. But here you see the power, they did generate power here on the site since the requirement for a received site was so much less. The hotel, the cottages here. And over here out of the frame is where the magic really took place. That was the receiving area where you see one tower up here. Uh, there was actually seven towers and the wire from that tower came down to the receive site. And here's another, another view. And you see, uh, get a better view of more of the towers and this guy, this lattice tower here, this is part of a balancing antenna. Now I found fragments of the poles supporting this way, way back over the hills on some ranchers' lands. And we did extensive research, we being the Maritime Radio Historical Society. And this is the balancing antenna. And you know, they, they, there's so much to it, but anyway, that, that there's a lot of artifacts and the balancing antenna was used to balance out the signal they were getting from Bolinas over 25 miles away, so it wouldn't overwhelm the signal they were getting from Hawaii. Very interesting technology. Well, this all worked great right up through uh, World War I. The US government said to the American Marconi Company, okay, you did great. We really don't know if we could have won the war without you. You're absolutely reliable, thank you so much. And you're done. You are done here, pack up your stuff, sell all your assets to the Radio Corporation of America. We cannot have the infrastructure of our telecommunications systems owned by a foreign entity. A big blow to the Marconi company, but they had no choice. And to this day, when you fill out the form for an FCC license, it asks you, are more than 50% of your board of directors uh, non-citizens? Well, here are the same view. This is where this, this is, in this room here is where that spark transmitter was. Well, RCA, Radio Corporation of America, took over, ripped out all the Marconi stuff, put in these two magnificent Alexanderson alternators. Unbelievable rotating machines. Ernst Alexanderson was an electrical and mechanical genius. Here they're generating these enormously powerful electrical radio waves by rotating machinery. And these things spun at enormous speed and they had to operate with very, very tight tolerances as to speed and clearance in the alternator. I mean, if there's any error there, you didn't have an alternator anymore. You just had shrapnel and a couple of wounded guys laying around. Never happened. These things were used around the world. There is one still operating today in Ernst Alexanderson's home country of Sweden. And they actually put it on the air several times a year. And one of our guys has made the pilgrimage. He has seen the great machine. He has approached it and he has touched the sacred casting and then backed away reverently and never washed his hand again. Now I made up that last part, but everything else is true. These things are just enormous. And here's the rest of it. This is again, looking in building one here at uh, Bolinas, and you see all the rest of the apparatus that it takes to make this thing work. 
you know, it was just enormous. But if you were going to be in the intercontinental communications business at that time, this is what you needed to have. And everybody had one. And, he, and all the countries, the, uh, the government ent entities in the United States, private entities, you had to have a uh, Alexanderson alternator. Well, Marconi is done in the US, but he's not done internationally. And here he's got this beautiful yacht, the Elettra, and he's got it fitted out with this magnificent experimental radio room, also as a place to entertain the ladies. That's another aspect. Holy mackerel. But anyway, down in the radio room, and he's starting to get an inkling that something's up, that this, these Alexanderson alternators, magnificent machines, they depended on the belief that you needed gobs of power. Each one of those was 200,000 watts. Gobs of power, enormously long wavelengths to leap across the oceans. He started to getting hints that maybe that really wasn't absolutely necessary. He started hearing long, long distance transmissions on high, high frequency, what they call short wave, short wave frequencies. And he realized, and during the daylight too, and he started to realize, you know, with much less power um, and during 24 hours a day, this short wave stuff, what we would call today disruptive technology, that may be the future. And he had contracts to build several of these long wave intercontinental stations, and he could have gone ahead and built them. Uh, exactly as the contract uh, called upon him to do and made tons of money. But again, bet his company, bet his reputation, bet his fortune on this very unproven shortwave technology. Then they said, nope, this isn't the way you want to go. I will build you shortwave stations instead. If they don't work, don't pay me. But I think this is the way it's going to go. And of course, he was absolutely right. So back here at Bolinas, now look at all the antennas because with a short wave, you can have multiple circuits to multiple countries all going at the same time. Just uh, amazing, amazing technology and, and, and a new building. Here's building two. Here's the original Marconi building out on the coast here. Building two to accommodate all these new short wave transmitters. And here's some, <laughs> oh man. Um, this is a shot taken obviously from one of the top of the, one of the poles. And you see some insulators there and some stuff. And you see this here. Okay, let's, what is this? You look a little closer and there he is. There's a guy, he's riding the guy wires. And, and we came across the boson chair he used for that. And the re reason we know is that it's got kind of wheels like inline skates, but they're angled at about a 45 degree angle. So here he is, he's riding up and down the guy wires to, to do, do the maintenance of the antennas. I mean, brass, you know, brass ones, I'm, I'm telling you, these guys, and I met, I, I met, they were still around when I first got there, and it's great, great guys. Well, meanwhile, while all this is going on, leaping ahead now, um, it's decided that in Point Ray Station, after the Vision Fire, which was a, a, a big impetus, we needed our own radio station. We needed to be able to communicate with our folks. We didn't need to leap across the oceans. We needed to leap around West Marin. And here is the pole that was originally out front of the red barn in Point Reyes. And this is where I learned something great from James Stark. Because, you know, if you said, I'm going to put in a new pole and, you know, where's here's a sign here, here's a stack of permits and you've got to do that. No, no. He said, no, no, no. Nothing new at all. We're just going to replace this pole. We're going to replace it. Nothing to see here. Everything good. The pole happens to be twice as high, but don't look at that. Everything cool. So here's the original pole that was there. And here's now the pole is gone. And here's the hole for the new pole. And, and as you can see, my mode of dress has changed radically since those days. Um, so I'm holding a coin and could, because traditionally when you step a mast in a, in a new sailboat, you have a coin at the, at the base of the mast. So Kay Clements and I, we have our coin going to put it down in the bottom of the hole before the, the new pole goes in. And we write, or I forget, I uh, see Kay's name there, and I put my name right up at the top of the hole, still there till this day. And here comes the new pole uh, getting put in. And here I am carrying the, uh, the transmitter. You notice the frequency, 89.3. That's what we were on on the cable system and TV channel one, because that was in the manger there outside. That's, that's where KWMR started on the, on the cable system. So 
But here I am carrying in the transmitter and um, and here's now we got the right frequency. We actually got a license from the FCC. Amazing. I, uh, we thought we were going to be filed against all the rest of it, but no, we, we did it. We got it. That was a very, very big deal. And here's the new pole, 182 raging watts. And we didn't notice the UFO until later, but here's the new um, pole, which is still there and the antenna is still there too. So that's, and we went on the air, radio station, new radio station. I remember, oh, it was one of the most fantastic thing. The whole community in the red barn, big old knife switch that we, and a band, and all the rest of it. I mean, here on our little frequency, 90.5, in, in the eons of time, nothing there's silence just the, the the whispering of galaxies and stars but nothing now we throw this switch and boom here's this signal uh, the beginnings of a community radio system and here's k uh, in the uh, in our first studio up in the red barn and it really wasn't much as as you can see um there was an office outside there and here's the the board that we had but we were on the air that was what counted we're definitely on the air and it right away became a community radio station with storytelling and music and spoken word and poetry and just all the rest of it just immediately became part of the community. But we came back to Bolinas. We're looping around now. We came right back to Bolinas. Here is the inside of building two. We saw that where all the shortwave transmitters were. Here's Jerry Lunsford, our departed pal, Jerry Lunsford, and he's helping us to put together a cabinet that the transmitter is going to go in for our new translator down in Bolinas to help serve the community in Bolinas and Stinson Beach. So back to Bolinas, right to the very spot where we saw those pictures earlier. And here's a very brave man up at the top of this 100 foot pole. Might even be with us tonight. I can't really see who's attending. Uh, but Don, if you're with us, Way to go, man. Probably wouldn't do that again. <laughs> but here he is up at the top of this 100 foot pole. And here goes the antenna up to Don, to uh, Don Muscle, to connect that all up. And here's me down in the phone room. Um, as you can see, not the neatest arena. I have to say, this is not my work, right? This is just <laughs> as found. But cutting over the lines, the audio lines from uh, point rays. So it's going to feed the translator in Bolinas. And man, that thing got out like gangbusters. That was really, uh, sadly, through some bureaucratic and technical things, we had to move it. Um, and we're doing a lot better than we were initially when we had to move it. But that one, that one really, that really covered the waterfront. And here's Kay. You know, the first thing you do, of course, is uh, after you put a new transmitter on the air, you ride around and see where you can hear it. And you see that she's smiling. So you're probably doing pretty good. Getting a, getting a signal out in, in Bolinas. Back up here in Point Reyes, one of the commitments that the radio station made before it was even a radio station was to be there for the community in an emergency. And I am as proud as I am of anything that through subsequent board of directors and subsequent uh, chairs of the board and executive director, that never wavered, that, co that commitment never wavered. And here in the very early days, here's here's Jerry on the air. We've got a generator going. He's, he's got a, a lamp, you know, a lantern there, but we're on the air, we're on the air and the power's out, of course, as always, power's out, but the station's on the air. Well, part of that emergency operations, we were very lucky, uh, Kay and I got to, uh, I mean, uh, Amanda and I uh, were able to, pick up the Greenpeace communications van. I, I spent 30 years of uh, my life uh, working for the firm. And this was the originally the Greenpeace surveillance van uh, that I built and put into service in 1991. I squandered the flower of my middle age in this van, let me tell you. So about two years after I retired from the firm, they gave us a call and said, look, Dillman, nobody knows how to operate this thing except you. So why don't you come and get it and use it in West Marin? So, uh, Amanda and I did, we went down to the San Francisco equipment warehouse and I expected, and they said, and fairly enough, that they would be removing the electronics. We would have the van and the antennas and the generator, all the rest of it. Great, okay, we can, we can put in the electronics. I look in through the windshield into the back, all the electronics is still there. <laughs> I said, okay, we'll be leaving now. 
boom, out of there. So we got this completely equipped van. I took out um, the surveillance stuff and we put in KWMR stuff, county fire radios. So we are, we are ready uh, for whatever happens. And just extraordinary, a little peanut whistle station like KWMR has, has resources like this just, just fell in our hands. And here, one of the most important things to me, one of the things I'm proudest of, is when we inaugurated this van, and of course you see we all have our snappy uniforms, and yes, Amanda, with action backs, um, Chief Masuko, Chief of the Department, Chief of the Marin County Fire, thought well enough of it to take his time to come and attend that dedication and make a speech. Now that, to me, that was very moving, very important. And we've been using the van here. We were doing election coverage. Um, we got, you know, configure it to however, however it needs to be configured so we can broadcast back to the station. And also participating in community events. Uh, this is uh, one of the Far West Fest uh, events. And we have, uh, you know, our table there and all, all the rest of it. And here's the, uh, the radiogram girls. We are sending live, true live Morse code radiograms uh, from the dance pals people for Valentine's or uh, sweethearts of the radio. So people would fill out their radiogram blanks and send them over to me, hey, pounding away over there, sending them out. They were actually really transmitted and actually received at the other end. Of course, Sally's styling it, you know, and Mia looking so great. <laughs> Got my KWMR tie on. And here I am up at the uh, Mount Vision, the main transmitter site. We moved from that pole in the, um, in the yard of the Red Barn up to Mount Vision and we're able to bump up power. So we have the coverage we do and the sharp eyed among you will notice that the transmitter that I was carrying into the Red Barn is the very transmitter over my shoulder. We're still using, it's on the air right now today. And also in here are the uh, repeaters and, and the rest of it for the, for the West Marin Disaster Council for our two-way radio emergency communication service. So again, the, the station and the infrastructure has, has been there for the emergencies when needed in our area. Well, we've modernized a brand new con, uh, control console, just beautiful view of what finally we're through, you know, I don't know how Amanda does it to raise this money and get these grants and get, and, but eventually it happens as this great uh, console, just a vast improvement over what we had. And here's the whole group. I mean, this is such a moving photo, the whole community out in front of our station for the 60s dance party that we had a couple of years ago. So that from that very beginning of that spark going across the room, right around to Bolinas and back up to Point Reyes, we have this community radio station, the community radio station where the flame of true community radio burns with the white heat of a thousand suns. Thank you very much. Unmute. Thank you, Richard, so much for, uh, and we, are, we have some questions that have come in. I'm sure, I don't know if you can see these too, you probably can. Um, uh, Don Smith asks about a tour of Building One. Tour of Building One, the most sacred spot on the site, <clears throat> unable to do it. Um, it is actually been vastly cleaned up but it is off limits according to the uh, park service. Now, maybe a special arrangement for a, you know, a, a particular viewing could be made. Uh, there's, it's really not much to see in there anymore, very sadly, but if you know what you're looking for, you can actually see the artifacts of a lot of the things that we saw these photos of. Uh, once we are past, all we have to do is overcome a uh, international pandemic and will be open again on Saturdays. The Maritime Radio Historical Society operates the station every Saturdays or did before we were unable to get in because of the COVID restrictions. But you can definitely come and see what's happening in building two where we have live transmitters on the air and actual live radio men too. Another question um, that came in was, why did they choose Bolinas and Marshall to build these things? Yeah, good questions. I, might have mentioned that. Uh, Bolinas, because there was enough flat land, um, it was close 
to a metropolitan area, San Francisco, and it made good sense so that you're, you're always talking about money here. What's the balance sheet? So they didn't have to build a power plant. They were close enough to run telegraph lines into a main metropolitan area, enough flat land for all the antennas they needed. And in Marshall, it was a good shot, even though you're going over the Point Reyes Peninsula, it was a good shot right over to Hawaii, which was the first leap. Eventually, they went to the Japan directly. So just to make sure I, I wasn't given wrong information, I went up on the hill where those towers were with my little hand compass and took a sighting. And sure enough, you can see all the bases and all the guys are still there. And sure enough, lined up directly aimed at Hawaii. All right, uh, there's a question that says from Dewey that says, was that Jimmy Bourne way up there and, and Don who? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't know if that was Jimmy. Uh, we have, uh, Dewey, I know you're familiar with the photo of a bunch of guys who are lined up at the, uh, at the base of the tower and, and Jimmy Bourne, I was honored to actually meet. Um, Richard Nielsen, I think knows the identity of the guy who's out there on that guy wire, but it escapes me. And Don, that's Don Muscle. Uh, he's a broadcast engineer and he was instrumental in helping us in uh, a lot of the things that we did in the early days of, uh, of KWMR, now uh, practicing his trade in, in Hawaii. And then we have a comment that says, they live in Oakland, have always enjoyed the radio plays at Toby's. Thank you for all you do. We do sell t-shirts. You can go to the kwmr.org site and we have a little shop button over on the right-hand side of the menu. And we don't keep the inventory here. We found it better to outsource that, but we have some nice designs. If there's something that you don't see and you'd like it, just let me know. All right, we have some compliments, of course. I can't believe the accolades that are showered upon you, Richard Dillman, and your presentation is, are always so fantastic. Um, from Paula says, do you know what year was the first transmission to from Hawaii? Yes, I do. It was in 1914, and in fact, it was in February 1914 that the station in Bolinas went on the air and that the received site in Marshall went into service. Right. And uh, Ken asks, what, uh, well, we have two Kens. Ken Adams says, amazing Richard fills in so many gaps, and that's great because he works at Commonweal down there where those buildings are located. Ken Eichstead says, what is the oldest piece of equipment from the original facility, and what is the oldest piece that still operates? The oldest piece that still operates is a transmitter built in 1942, and it was not native to the site. Uh, we recovered it from another transmitter site before it got scrapped. From the stuff that's native to the site, we have almost nothing, well, nothing at all from the Spark era and almost nothing from the Alexanderson era, some insulators and so forth is all we've got. So it really is from basically World War II forward that we've actually got artifacts that we can lay hands on. All right, Mia has put a link up for the merchandise. I have put a link up for <clears throat> Richard Dillman's crowdfunding page in case you want to shower him with dollars as well as compliments. <clears throat> uh, Kathy and Rob Richards ask, when can we see the Morse code uh, and radio operation again after COVID? I believe the public is invited one Saturday a month. I think you mentioned that, but go ahead and give that information again for sure. Yeah, that that's absolutely right, Amanda. And, um, you know, our guys are just absolutely Jones and they can't wait. They, they, they got to get back to this site. So, but it's not up to us. And of course, the park uh, wisely has suspended volunteer activities. Once they make the decision it's safe, then we'll be back. But we have no idea when that'll be. All right. Any other questions? Let's see. Uh, wait, was it an estimate of how many messages were sent on an average day? Ah, uh, yes. Well, we don't actually have those records, but we do know what they consider to be a commercial speed. And they were saying they were getting, you know, up to 70 words a minute, which is, I mean, that's faster than a person can send. 
uh, some of the, except the absolute top notch sender. So it was being sent by a machine. So 70 words a minute, and I guess they tried to operate 24 hours a day, but what the actual traffic load was, we just don't have those figures. Oh, okay. Um, from Dewey, is it true that the 1914 station was the first high power station to cross the Pacific? Others had preceded it. I believe that is true. There were other attempts, um, but I don't think before that date, there was the beach station in San Francisco that, uh, but that was, came later. And there, there, were, there were the mystery towers up on Mount Tam. That's a whole other story. There were two towers up there. Nobody knew quite what they were up to. Um, but I think this is really the only one that was uh, successful. And Dewey did a pipe in early in the presentation that the ranch that we were seeing early on when you were first showing us those buildings off um, up on the, on the Mesa was Ingerman, the Inger, right. yeah. Ingerman ranch. Thank you for that, yes. Let's see, we have uh, from Tom Jordan, the 42 rainbow message, question mark. You got me on that one, Tom. I'm not sure what he's referring to there. Uh, any other questions for Richard? Do I miss anything here? I think so. One thing we do have, um, I'll just mention that for the time when folks are able to visit, it's an artifact that I don't remember to show all the time, but we have, there's two aspects to this station. One is the point to point, the Trans-Pacific work we've been talking about. The other is the Morse code service to ships at sea. And that's what we've restored. That's what's in operation on Saturdays when we can get back in there. And one of the most amazing things we have is the log of the station from December, 1941. And we had copies of it, but I got a call three or four years ago from the daughter of the station manager, Frank Geisel, got a call from Gloria Geisel saying, Richard, come and see me, I have something for you. So of course I went and she handed me the actual original log. So we immediately gave that to the archivists in the Point Reyes National Seashore. I mean, God forbid that something should happen to it while it was on our hands and they made this very high quality copy for us. And in that, you see nothing. It's very boring. It's a Saturday afternoon, you know, just like it was in Hawaii, Saturday morning in Hawaii. And then things start getting strange and you see these messages they're copying. I won't go into detail, except that it gives me goosebumps even to think of it now, because you see that message. That message that says, Air Raid Pearl Harbor, this is no drill execute war plan 46 against Japan. War plan 46, we got nothing. All the battleships are on the bottom of the harbor. What do we got? The Air Force is gone. MacArthur's B-17s are being bombed in Manila. Chilling. You can imagine what was going through the minds of the guys who were receiving this stuff. So when you come and see us, we'd be happy to show that to you. Um, Charlie, who is impersonating me only because I helped him sign on, um, is asking, how does KPH fit into this? Yeah, thanks. It's a um, story I should have made more clear. KPH is the call sign of that ship to shore uh, Morse code telegraph service. So that's the part that we've restored. KPH, the PH coming from the Palace Hotel where the station started in 1905. So that's KPH, that's what we've restored. That's what's back on the air today. All right, and then Tom um, is clarifying, I believe, by saying Rainbow Five. So I don't know if that clarifies things. Yeah, sorry, Tom. <laughs> cryptic, that guy, he's so cryptic sometimes. Uh, all right, does anybody else have any other questions? Great turnout tonight for people. Thanks for sticking around, folks. Um, and thanks for uh, many of you. I recognize your names as calendar club members and supporters of KWMR. So thank you all so much for all your support of this radio station. Any last words, Artie? Well, I just got to echo that. Um, it's uh, just, it, you know, it's the, the best thing, the best colleagues, the best job, the, the best thing I've, I've really been involved in. And I'm just so thankful to be part of the team. So thank you, Amanda. Yeah, we have a really good team here. Um, all right, well, I think if I don't see any other questions, we'll go ahead and conclude this just a few minutes early. How about that? That's pretty awesome. 
and uh, we can all head on and do something else and more thank yous and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, for your support of KWMR. Good evening. <laughs>